Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we'll be doing our sixth video on the immune system. We're gonna be talking about types of immunity. So we'll talk about vaccinations and other types of immunotherapies that can be utilized to help protect our body from infections. So stay tuned. Hi, and welcome back to our conversation on the immune system. Today, we're gonna to be talking about types of immunity. So immunity is rooted in the two key aspects of our adaptive immune system, memory and specificity. It's a, the ability of our adaptive immune system to respond to specific antigens and then form memory B and memory T cells that will remember that infection at a later date. This is very important because memory B cells and memory T cells are a lot easier to reactivate in response to the recurrence of an infection. It's also important because when we when those memory cells are made, they're often present in significantly higher abundance than the original T and B cell clones were. And more importantly, they're put in locations where they're most likely to encounter their cognate antigen. Think, for example, of our resident memory T cells that are hanging around the tissues that can rapidly respond to the reappearance of a given pathogen in that particular tissue. Now, when your body remembers an infection and it is reactivated in response to the reemergence of that particular infection, the response of your immune system is often so rapid and so fierce that you may not ever know that you were exposed. But should you actually develop an infection, it's often significantly less severe and significantly shorter lived than it would be if it were a novel infection. Now, we're going to talk about two different types of immunity, natural and artificial, and how these work. So natural immunity is quite simple. Natural immunity is the type of immunity that you acquire through your normal life experiences. And natural immunity can be acquired passively or actively. The great example of passive natural immunity occurs through breastfeeding. So if you recall from our previous conversation about antibodies, mothers produce IgA antibodies and secrete them into their breast milk to help protect the digestive tracts of their breastfeeding infants. This is a great example of passive immunity. It's passive because the baby itself is not producing the antibodies. And those antibodies only remain in the system until they're used or they, they break apart and they need to be replaced by future antibodies provided in the breast milk. The same thing is true of uh, another example of this would be uh, with IgG antibodies that cross, uh, 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 that cross the placenta and help protect the fetus while it's in utero. This is, again, passive immunity. The, uh, the immune material is being produced by the mother and delivered to the baby. Active uh, natural immunity is quite simply you being exposed to things in the real world. So if you're exposed to pathogens, your body mounts an immune response that eventually remembers that at a later date, that is natural active immunity. It's active because your own body is producing the materials needed to, to develop an immunologic memory. You're developing your own memory T cells and your own memory B cells because you yourself have been exposed to that particular pathogen. So artificial immunity as opposed to natural immunity is conferred by exposing somebody through some type of medical intervention used to induce immunity. So like we saw with natural immunity, artificial immunity can be both passive and artificial. One of the best examples of passive artificial immunity is antibody cocktails. So currently, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, two companies in the U.S. have been working on uh, antibody cocktails as a potential way of preventing or treating COVID-19 infections. The, the way they're doing this is, is fairly simple. They are using a humanized mouse model uh, in order to produce antibodies against the viral spike protein that's needed for the virus to actually bind to the ACE2 receptor on the surface of our cells, which causes the infection. This is rooted in something called convalescent plasma therapy, which has been used in the cases of other viral infections, perhaps most notably Ebola, where they simply take and purify antibodies from another exposed patient's blood and use it to treat a subsequent patient. The problem in this case is so many people are infected with COVID-19 that there is no way to purify and produce enough natural antibody from sick patients to be utilized to treat or prevent all the potential infections that we're going to see. That's why both of these companies have moved to a mouse model that uses a humanized immune system to produce antibodies that would be functional in a human being. 
Now, there are two companies that are doing this, uh, and, and one of them, as of a few days before this recording, actually just ceased their clinical trials, citing uh, potential health concerns, as well as the fact that it did not appear to be effective in treating uh, patients uh, that are undergoing uh, COVID-19 therapy. I will say this, one of those uh, treatments was actually utilized when President Trump was hospitalized with COVID uh, at the beginning of October. Um, so there is one that is still currently undergoing uh, clinical trials, but we don't know the results of that at the time of this recording. Regardless of whether it's effective in these particular cases, um, antibody cocktail therapy has been used very effectively uh, in, to treat uh, previous types of viral infections, but it's also utilized heavily as an anti-cancer therapeutic as well as an anti-autoimmune therapeutic. Now, the other type of artificial immunity is active artificial immunity, and the best example of this is uh, vaccination. So uh, vaccines are produced through a couple different pathways, and the goal of them is to expose a person's body to something that closely resembles uh, a particular pathogen and then allow their body to be tricked into making some type of immune response and developing an immunological memory to something that they've actually never really been exposed to. So there's a couple ways to go about this. One of them uh, is to use what's called a non-infectious uh, vaccination. This typically uses either a completely dead virus or pathogen um, or either or parts of that particular pathogen or a toxoid, something that resembles a bacterial toxin that might be used, uh, that might be the cause of an infection. The other way to do this is something called an attenuated virus vaccination. This is where you don't kill the virus, uh, but you weaken it to the point where it's really non, uh, not super infectious and can't really cause a full-blown viral infection, but it's strong enough to induce a pronounced immune response from your body. Now, there are pros and cons to both of these pathways, so let's look at them each in turn. So non-infectious vaccines are, are used in the case of either bacterial infections or viral infections. In the case of viral infections, they'll be utilizing uh, commonly what we call uh, a, a, a dead virus. Essentially, the virus is inactivated through certain treatments. Uh, and as a result, it can't cause any type of infection. So that's a pro. Same thing is true of the bacterial uh, subunit vaccines uh, So, for example, or toxoid vaccinations. So, for example, if we look at the DTaP vaccine, tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis, they contain no whole organisms whatsoever. In fact, they contain uh, either diff either subunits in the case of the pertussis bacterium, or they contain toxoids against diphtheria toxin or tetanus toxin. Um, so things that look like or a deformed version of the toxin that can harm your body. And as a result, your body uh, is able to mount an immune response against these uh, different toxoids or, or cellular subcomponents that can recognize and those antibodies that are produced in response to a recurrence of that infection uh, occur very rapidly and are able to rid your body of the infection, rendering, the com rendering you completely immune to them. Now, in the case of the viral vaccines, the downside uh, to these types of vaccinations is while they will produce memory B cells and CD4 positive central memory cells, they will not produce CD8 positive memory cells. So those are killer T cells. And in the case of viral infections, this could be a problem because remember your CD8 positive killer T cells, those are the ones that we actually need to help fight off the viral infection. So while they are effective, they're not as effective because they don't produce that particular lineage of memory T cell, which would be needed to fight off a viral infection. If we turn on the other hand to attenuated virus vaccines, where the virus is still a uh, quote air quotes alive, but not very infectious, uh, these viral vaccinations um, are actually quite effective because they will activate all branches of immunologic memory. So you will get CD4 positive and CD8 positive sentry memory cells. So you will have memory killer T cells in addition to memory helper T cells. Um, and you will also get memory B cells. Now, the downside to this is these attenuated virus vaccines can only be given to people that are immunocompetent. And the reason why is they, the, they are less dangerous because they are a weakened virus. But people who are immunocompromised, people who are pregnant, underage, or have other immunocompromising conditions, uh, they can actually develop a full-blown viral infection, even though this is an attenuated virus. So while they are better in certain circumstances, there are potential problems for them. So an example of this would be the intranasal uh, flu vaccination and the MMR. So the MMR uses attenuated versions of the measles, the mumps, and the rubella virus uh, when we give it to people. It's one of the reasons why they often ask, are you healthy uh, before you, they give it to you because it is an attenuated virus vaccine. When it comes to flu vaccinations, most flu vaccinations are actually in the inactivated virus or the non-infectious virus category. Um, it's just the intranasal one that is using uh, active virus to cause, uh, to, to develop immunity. Now, if we turn to what's going on with coronavirus, there are a number of coronavirus vaccinations 
uh, uh, being produced uh, or being investigated uh, throughout the world. And from the research that I've done, it looks like pretty much every avenue of uh, vaccine research is being applied. Some of them are using subunits. Some of them are using attenuated virus. Some of them are using inactivated virus. So there are a lot of different approaches being taken. And the bottom line is, is we're, we are so far behind in creating this vaccine. We were caught so off guard by this particular pandemic. It's sort of a kitchen sink approach. Everybody's kind of trying everything and we're hoping that we land on one or two or even three or four that are very effective and can be produced. The big thing that's going to be needed in order to help uh, vaccinate us against coronavirus is a safe, effective vaccination that can be produced in, in abundance. And one of the issues that we're going to have is there's not going to be the availability to do a lot of long-term studies of these particular vaccinations prior to them becoming available because they're needed now. Uh, so uh, stay on the lookout. Uh, as of the recording of this video, there is no uh, coronavirus vaccination that is widely available in the world. I will update this video uh, if we end up getting um, one of those produced sometime in the near future, but stay tuned to that. So the last thing I wanna talk about in this video is herd immunity. And the reason I wanna talk about it is it's a very important immunological concept. It's also one that's being talked about quite broadly given the ongoing conversation around the worldwide pandemic involving COVID-19. So what is herd immunity? So herd immunity is the concept that if a large proportion of a population is immune to a given disease or pathogen, then it's very hard for that pathogen to cause widespread epidemics because essentially after a couple people, it runs into somebody who's immune to it and it hits a dead end. So herd immunity is real and it does work. Now there are a couple requirements for herd immunity to work. Um, most experts estimate that it, at a very minimum you need about 75% of a population to be immune to a given disease in order to get some type of a protection from herd immunity. Odds are though, and in some studies it's been shown that at least for particular diseases, that number may be uh, as high as 80 to 90 percent of individuals will need to be vaccinated to prevent at least local outbreaks of a given infection. So we need to get to that point in order to develop herd immunity. Now herd immunity also is it requires a, a couple of other things uh, to happen in order to be effective. So let's talk about COVID-19 in the United States as an example. So right now there are about 8.8 .8 million people in the United States who have been exposed to been exposed to COVID-19. And based on that, about 2.5% of those people have actually died as a result of COVID-19 infection. So our fatality rate is about 2.5%. Now let's look at what would happen if we relied strictly upon herd immunity in order for us to sort of stave this pandemic off and sort of go back to normal in the United States. I can tell you that the numbers are not pretty. So let's use some baseline numbers that we know about herd immunity and some of the numbers that we know about from the, from the epidemiology of this disease in the United States to have this conversation. First off, the United States has a population of about 30, uh, 331 million people as of the recording of this video. Now, in order for us to develop herd immunity, most experts agree that you need about 75% of your population to be exposed to that particular infection and be immune to it in order to develop at least some protection. So we'll start with the lowest number possible, 75%, although some experts would argue that it's significantly higher, at least in the case of some diseases. It's unknown for COVID-19. So 75% of 331 million is about 249 million people. So we can already subtract the roughly 9 million people who have been exposed to the coronavirus and end up with a nice round 240 million individuals who would need to be exposed and become immune to COVID-19 in order to develop at least some margin of herd immunity in the United States. But there's a problem with that because the current fatality rate for COVID-19 infection is about 2.5%. And if you look at those 240 million people, of those, based on this particular mortality rate, we're looking at about... 6 million people who would die. So at baseline, with the lowest percentage of people needed to get any sort of herd immunity, based on expert analysis, 6 million Americans would die if we relied strictly on herd immunity. Now let's go, and, some, and now some people would like to argue that the fatality number, the mortality rate is actually lower. It's actually right around 1%. If we get rid of all of those individuals who don't have some type of pre-existing condition that makes them particularly susceptible to the virus. Okay, great, now let's be real the virus doesn't care who it infects. It's not going to go around infecting those specifically who aren't immune to this or, or aren't susceptible to this infection. But let's play the game anyways. 1% of 240 million people is still 2.4 million people. That's 2.4 million people on the lowest scale that we would lose to COVID-19 if we just went, let's just rely on herd immunity. This is highly problematic. 
because this is not a good approach to developing a public health policy around a particularly infectious disease, a particularly fatal disease. If you want to develop herd immunity, there are things that need to happen. First off, if we're going to develop herd immunity, we need to develop it safely. We don't develop herd immunity by exposing people to harmful diseases. We need to develop herd immunity by giving people things like vaccinations. So it's very easy to develop a large amount of population that's immune to measles, mumps, and rubella because we can give them an MMR vaccination because then they're safely prevented from catching. They've safely developed immunity and won't catch the disease in any way, shape, or form. We don't want to do it with a live virus. The other thing we have to consider is this. Herd immunity, you want the individuals to develop lasting immunity. We have no idea how long people are immune to COVID-19 once they've been exposed to the virus. We know at this point that people develop antibodies for at least seven months after they've been infected. But let's look at an example like the flu. The flu, you have to get a flu shot every year because the flu mutates so rapidly through antigenic drift that every year you need a new flu shot because your body doesn't develop lasting immunity to the flu virus because it's changed so much. Now, we do know that the coronavirus mutates at a slower rate than influenza, but we still don't know how long individuals would develop immunity to this particular virus. So what that means is if we expose 240 million people to COVID virus and we lose somewhere between 2.4 and 6 million individuals between now and next year, we might have to do it all over again in a year or two and lose another 2.4 to 6 million people to continue the herd immunity. The bottom line is this, until we have a COVID-19 vaccination, herd immunity is not a viable option. Re exposing people to COVID-19 to develop herd immunity as our only defense is not only bad public policy, it's a real problem. It doesn't work. The odds are that it wouldn't work and it would just result in the needless death of millions of Americans. So when you hear people talking about, oh, well, we'll just develop herd immunity to it, realize the real consequence of that is the loss of millions of American lives in response to that. Thank you so much for tuning in today to continue our conversation about the immune system. Today we talked about types of immunity. We talked about passive immunity and, and, and active immunity. We talked about natural immunity and artificial immunity, things like vaccinations. We also talked about herd immunity. In our next video, we'll be talking about diseases of the immune system. So what happens when our immune system goes wrong? I look forward to talking to you guys again soon. I hope you guys are learning a lot. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye.